Hey everybody and welcome to the Tyler Fisher Show episode 50 something. That's right, the name is back, we're back. We're back to the Tyler Fisher Show. I, you know, I did three episodes of fun times or two, I'm not even sure. And the people have spoken and I set a poll and I just said, well, tell me what name, I don't want to get caught up on the name. It doesn't, it doesn't matter. But that was kind of, the title was too long. Name of the episode, episode number. Fun times with Tyler Fisher. I ran out of space on YouTube. So straight to the point, Tyler Fisher, who am I? Tyler Fisher, what is this, a show? What is it? The Tyler Fisher Show, that's right. And so we're picking up where we left off. I did 50-something episodes, and I don't want to throw that under the bus. You know, I took a little break, did a movie, did all sorts of stuff, toured, and, and now we're back, baby. And I'm so excited because now we're set up to have guests on and... I'm so excited for my guest today. Uh, real quick, I got some shows coming up. I'm doing my hour show in Brooklyn, May 22nd, Old Man Hustle, 8 p.m. That's Brooklyn, New York, um, where I, I work on my new hour. If you've been before, it might change a little bit, but I go, I get messy, I try stuff, I bomb, I kill. It's a fun time. It's a roller coaster of emotion. Um, then we got Vulcan Gas Company, Austin, Texas, June 30th, 8 p.m., Friday, July 15th, Stardom Comedy club in hoover alabama that's hoover alabama 8 p.m and then we got uh zanies in nashville heard that's a fan, another fantastic club 7 p.m july 16th and i think that's july 15th at stardom in uh, hoover and then august 12th soul joel's big outdoor comedy dome it's frankly a big dome right no excuse me like dome we call it, I think it's like domicile, domicile, it's like a home, it's great, and that's in Pottstown, Pennsylvania. All those are at tylerfisher.com. Uh, without further ado, my guest on the show today, so excited, absolutely fantastic, I'd call her a internet personality, she has a wonderful podcast called Unapologetic with Amala, or Kamala, Amala, Kamala, so many ways to say it, frankly. So many ways, Epinobi. Oh, I am so excited for our guest today. Probably one of my favorite people on the internet. Hilarious, smart, intelligent, racist, extreme, <laughs> one-sided, no nuance. And she's got an amazing podcast called Unpo- Unapologetic. And she's here with us right now. Amala, wow. how the hell are you? I'm, I'm doing so well after that intro. That's a lot to live up to, especially the racist part. So I'm going to try. I'm going to try to live up to how you've described me. <laughs> well, OK, so th- this is uh, this is exciting. If anybody doesn't know, we were just both on the infamous one of the maybe the last episodes of all time of Dr. Phil. Nuclear family. These are uh, inherently extensions of whiteness. Listening to John Mayer. (laughs) According to Coca-Cola, these are extensions of whiteness, and they actually engaged in trainings where they taught their employees how to be less white. Yeah, yeah. What a crazy moment. When I walked in, I had no idea you were even going to be there. So to have you there, it was great to have just a familiar face because I was freaking out to be on TV, uh, and especially a show like Dr. Phil. Like, come on. Yeah, so I didn't know you were on. I didn't know Candace Owens was on. Um, can I ask, did you decide not to look up who was on the show? Yeah, I mean, I just was never briefed about what was going to be talked about. Well, for the most part, I got a a general overview of we're going to touch on affirmative action and how affirmative action might be affecting uh, white people and and things like that. That was literally all I got from the producers. And then I I showed up to the set and we, of course, had to go through the whole nasal swab process or whatever, uh, even though... We are way out of the, the the COVID narrative at that point, but went in for the nasal swab and they're like, hi, Candace. And I looked at the guy and went, ah, I'm definitely not Candace. But that clued me in that she oh, was going to be there. Oh, they thought you were Candace? And- yes. <laughs> yeah. The guy goes, hi, Candace. And I was like, well, I'm not Candace, but at least now I know that Candace Owens is going to be here. So. Okay. Cool. So, so, so now what's your, what's your, uh, what's your vibe on that? Is that racist to confuse two people? Uh, of the same race or not. I mean, that, that we could have done a whole episode on that on Dr. Phil. 
Sure. Yeah. You know, I get it. We all look alike. And uh, Candace and I have very similar viewpoints as far as politics goes. So I get it. I get confused for Candace more often than I would like, but it happens. So it must be a natural process. <laughs> all right. So would you rather be confused with Candace Owens or oh. in my case, Zach Galifianakis, <laughs> uh, Macaulay Culkin, <laughs> uh, homeless, homeless Aaron Paul? Or the wow. dwarf, uh, midget, well, you can't say midget anymore, the dwarf from uh, Game of Thrones. Oh, man. You know, Tyrion Lannister is pretty badass. I'll take uh, I'll take the dwarf or little person, I think, is the actual phrase we're supposed to use there, Tyler. I would take that uh, any day. Not to knock on Candace, but Tyrion Lannister is pretty badass. That's true. <laughs> I, well, it, it, midget's kind of, I consider it kind of like the N-word for small people. That's our word to use. It's not your word to use. Oh, you and you self-identify as a midget? I do. In fact, if I was like three inches shorter, I think I could get money from the government uh, like monthly. So I'm like, I'm this far away from getting a salary from the government. Oh, man, you got to hop on that. I know there's those new surgeries where you can adjust your height and most people are going taller. But I think in this day and age of the oppression Olympics, you should go shorter. <laughs> I think that's the way to go. Schedule your okay. surgery. <laughs> I would lose out on dates. Like I, I say that I wish I could change my height to millimeters on Tinder, just to tr <laughs> to trick women because you have to put your your height on the dating apps now, and women are now um, filtering out anybody under five foot ten. It, I, I I met with a um one of the higher ups at Hinge, mm -hmm. and she looks at me and she just goes, "You're screwed." She goes, almost nobody will go under 5'10 when they have the option. What, and have you tried it? Is Have you been on the apps, like swiping and, and doing all that fun stuff? So I, I used to get tons of matches, and once they added the height requirement, my matches went down like 95%. Wow. And wait till they add like, you know, vac status and political leaning. You're out of the running. You're done for. Oh, no. No, that's on there. That, it is? You haven't been on Oh yeah. Oh, you can add your race now. You can filter by race, body type. It's like, make up your mind. Do you want us to, to live in a, a, a non-judgmental, like fluid state or have all of these, uh, these identity like milestones where now everybody's just completely fragmented? Oh man, I mean, to date in this day and age, I think would ruin me psychologically. <laughs> I'm so glad that I don't have to deal with that anymore because I look hear from me. all these young women look, that are doing it. What was that? You look like I've been on fentanyl for a week. I, I've just been <laughs> dating. Uh, uh, <laughs> it's just been on Hinge, guys. <laughs> I just no, no, Amala. I was banned from Hinge. Oh no. <laughs> what I for? Was, what did you do? Well, so so I realized they only show me black women only. And so I started to screen record it and say like, hey, is this OK to force diversity with dating, racial diversity? And I posted it and I tagged Hinge and they banned me for life. Ooh, yeah, that'll do it. I think anything that has to do with race or politics on our side of things or any sort of skepticism is going to get you banned from the, the dating profiles. There is a new right wing dating profile. Have you heard of it? Uh, is it called Ted Cruzen? I, no. That's my idea for it. <laughs> Wouldn't that be a great oh dating God. app? Yeah, no, imagine. He needs to hop no, on that. No, what is it? What is it? I think it's called the right way or something like that. It was created by uh, Peter Thiel and a bunch of other, you know, right leaning people. And it's purely for conservatives, I think. Okay. Or maybe it's called the right stuff. So you can go on and find all your little conservative girlies to uh, go on dates with. What, what's your take on it? Do you think that's a good idea? Or does that now, you know, if politics isn't your main way of identifying, does that now cut out a potential 50% of liberal women who maybe have similar values. Right. You know, I think I view it like uh, Christian Mingle or J-Date. You know, if you're one of those people who your values are super central to who you are and you want to find somebody with the same values, by all means, go on a conservative dating app. I don't know that it's something that I would do because I like to have a little bit of diversity <laughs> uh, in the conversations that I have with people. So I, I would go for just... Uh, I guess a spectrum dating app, but if you are a conservative person who knows you want another conservative woman, then I guess that's the app for you. Right. I, I, I was actually swayed by Ben Shapiro um, 
which normally would take an hour, but he he got it out in about ten seconds because he's on <laughs> double speed. Uh, but he, ba- I was surprised. He basically said, "Don't judge someone you're dating by their political views. They might just be kind of parroting uh, whatever kind of woke agenda." But get down, or, or as he says, get down to the the absolute core values. A hundred percent. Yeah, I think if you sorry, are dating- real quick, real quick. This impression is brought to you by ExpressVPN. I have to say that every time I do the impression, I get 10% of what Ben gets. And speaking of 10%, get 10% off using code Ben. Wow. Go ahead. Beautiful. I wish I had an equal uh, or an equivalent Ben impression for you. Have it's you tried not one? Good. Oh, you know what? What is he? What is what's that mattress company that he's sponsored by? Oh, he- <laughs> Helix? Some uh, yeah, like, like Helix uh, Sweet uh, Mattress. Helix Mattress. If you if you want Helix. the best mattress that you and your wife have ever slept on, I mean, your kids will be hopping in this mattress. Uh, use code Shapiro. <laughs> you're gonna get fired. You're gonna sleep through your jobs. In fact, better off don't buy one because you're gonna sleep so well that you'll be as late as I was to this podcast because I have a I, Helix yeah. Sleep Mattress. <laughs> I, I love the hyperbolic statements he uses in his in his uh, sponsorships. But yeah, you know, I'm I'm right there with him. If you meet somebody and you know that they're just a generous person they they share your your values as far as like family and friendship and all these different things and you can get into those conversations without it becoming some heated mess then by all means like, date anybody on any side of the aisle and i think you'll find that it challenges you and your beliefs and makes them stronger and you never know just in knowing you and building this relationship they might be swayed if that's what you want yeah i i wish that were the case i'm what i'm running into is there's uh there seems to be like no negotiating on some of these these issues the the trans thing like I can't believe I find myself on a first date being like hey what do you do do you have siblings also if we had kids would you cut their boobs off uh, before the age of 18 those questions now are becoming really important to me which is so sad have you run into the crazier end of those answers and what do you do when you do run into that I run. I just run. <laughs> I thought I the like comedian to... and you would want to see through the date so you'd have a story, you know? Well, you know, like at this point, I have so much material. I'm like, I, 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 I'll give you an example. I was on a date uh, two weeks ago and I met this woman in the park. I, you know, it's really scary talking to women because they're, everyone has headphones on and they're on their mm-hmm. phone. You have to like, you have to like creep up on them without being too creepy somehow get them to take their headphones off, then repeat what you said because you didn't see their little earbuds, Um, impress them, get their number, ask them out, plan the date. So I did all that and then we were on a walk and she goes, oh, you're a comedian. She goes, "Um, well, here's some topics that are off limits. So I hope you don't talk about race, gender, um, you know, gender dysphoria, trans. She gave me a list of topics that I wasn't allowed to do before we even had a half a date. Oh my gosh, I'd be like, all right, that's my time. <laughs> just <laughs> I just got the light, that's my time. So I actually, um, uh, I actually ran away. I literally had my dog and I, I ran the other way. And it was like, she said, uh, I hate cis white male comedians, their time is up. And I was oh. like, like, how could you say that to me? But that is becoming, that's becoming, um, the, ex- the the rule, not the exception now in places like New York. Oh, man. I mean, that's that's terrifying to have to go through. I imagine there's a lot of just really scared men running around trying to somehow manage to get dates. But I don't know how you would do it in that sort of environment, especially in New York City. Oh, goodness. I can imagine it's just rampant. I think you got to have the majority of women sort of thinking that and they're in their girl boss era. So they're just shouting from the rooftops what they want. And are they finding men that actually believe these things or are there men that are just willing to parrot back to them what they're saying? I, I'm so confused. Par- the parroting. I think I think women women sort of create the sexual and romance market and men then change their behavior based on the demands. So they're just going along with it, going, you know, yeah, 32 genders? Absolutely. I, I, I think maybe there's, there's 42, to be honest. Like, let's... Yeah. Why stop Any, there? And Anything to make it to the bedroom, I think. <laughs> yeah, I have a friend that he has to come over and secretly talk about Jordan Peterson with me. Oh. Like, we're not, al- yeah, we're not allowed to um, talk about it because uh, his, you know, his girlfriend 
hates him and thinks he's like a far right guy. And so we kind of have our private conversations and we'll sneak off and watch certain comedians together. And, you know, I've been doing wow. that with for years with all sorts of friends. Like, yeah, I remember you have my like brother, a fight club my, for politics. Uh, I yeah, <laughs> it, it really is. yeah, we all get together in a basement and watch Ricky Gervais and quote <laughs> 12 rules for life. And like <laughs> the walls are soundproofed. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it, it's uh, it's terrifying. All right, I could talk to you for forty hours. So let's let's talk about this Doctor Phil episode. Yeah. Um, what what was the feedback like for for anyone that had, hasn't seen it? The episode originally was called, and I think they changed it. Um, like, can you be racist against white people? I think they adjusted it to discrimination. Is it a two way street? So yeah. it was me, you, and Candace. Um, and who was the other, uh, D Danielle D'Souza Gill, I think is her name. Danielle was on it. Yeah. And yeah. it was us four debating against a critical race theory professor and someone else in that similar category. Right. Right. Yeah. About whether, whether or not you can hire based on race or discriminate based on race. Uh, right. I think that's what happened. Yeah, I mean, it, it was it was a calmer episode than I, I maybe thought it was going to be. I thought we were going to get into far more heated discussions. I think the most powerful part of the episode, in fact, was your your story and coming forward and saying that because there was so much missing as far as just firsthand accounts of this sort of discrimination happening to people. So it was weird to me that they didn't get to your story to like the end of the episode and you just cut in <laughs> and it's like this oh shit, this is really happening. Here's somebody that this is actually happening to. And the guys who were talking this whole time, suddenly, nothing, suddenly nothing to say on on the matter and, and no rebuttal there. So it's so different to hear the stories from, from somebody uh, who has actually gone through it. But for the most part, I thought it was pretty clear cut and dry that the side that is anti-affirmative action and anti-discrimination is the side that is is taking the the, the W here. Absolutely. I think doc I was surprised Dr. Phil actually wrapped up the episode precisely by saying that, which is we can't hire based on race. It has to be on merit. And there's really no other way to do it. Um, yeah. But it, it, it's also fascinating that we're even at the point where we ha we're actually having that conversation on national television. <laughs> like, Can you discriminate against somebody based on their so-called privilege? Right. And Another thing just to know was like out of the panel, uh, the, the three women, two of which you're half well, half white, half black, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah. And maybe the only person that actually describes yourself that way rather than saying you're just black. And well, uh, and Candace. Right. And it's like I would say and I'm, I'm, I'm fine saying this. I, I'm the least successful person on that panel. So you have three mm -hmm. women and one man. And the white guy who's supposed to be so-called privileged and have, you know, uh, his his run of pretty much anything he wants out of the four, as far as like, you know, Internet popularity, um, you know, building your own brand. You, the three of you are, are way more successful. So I just I just thought this is so interesting. That isn't right. that in and of itself a pretty good indication that things have gotten to a pretty equal place. Yeah, hundred percent. It's such an interesting dynamic to explore through that lens, and then also through the lens of like, why is it only okay if we're the ones to say it? Does that not point to some sort of power or privilege that we have? And I mean, there's a, a very clear and distinct point to acknowledge that the reason that I think Candace and I are so popular or have been able to garner the audience that we've garnered is yes, because of the topics we're talking about and our viewpoints and our opinions and coming forward and sort of saying them unapologetically, but also it's our skin tone. <laughs> let's like, let's not lie. It helps to have this sort of skin tone and it helps to also be a female saying these sorts of things because we've done this whole identity politics game and now you have to be within a certain box to be able to espouse a certain view. And you are unfortunately not in that box, which is the, the whole reason you were on the Dr. Phil show in the first place, which is just insane. It's insane. That we're having these discussions on on television and honestly i would be fine if people said they want it both ways they, they want to say well white men are privileged they have everything but then they also want to say the most horrible things about them and tell them it's time to give up your job 
and you, you shouldn't get a promotion unless you're a certain skin tone. It's like, you can't have both. I would be fine if they were just honest and said, right. we, we don't want you to have the same opportunities. It's time to sit down and shut up. But it, at the very least, we're not going to say that you're privileged anymore. I would take that in a second. Yeah. But I can but no longer You're never going to get that trade off. <laughs> <laughs> I thought you were going to offer some... <laughs> Some healing so on this sorry. episode. I'm so sorry. I'm not going to offer you any healing. You're never going to get that trade off. It will always be both narrative spun at the same time. And it's unbelievable. Like you hear the likes of Ibram X. Kendi, who I'm sure you're, you're well acquainted with. And this idea of how how to be anti-racist and he's quite literally telling people the way that we fix past discrimination is with present discrimination. That's how we're going to do it. Word for word. That is his quote. And also coupling that with this idea of privilege. So my question is, at what point do we do exactly what you said? At what point do we let go of the privilege narrative once we've discriminated for how many years? What what metrics exactly. are we going for before we say these people are no longer privileged and we've even the playing field? It never stops. Right. Knowing, knowing the limit. No one ever talks about, well, what's the limit? And again, if you can make a good case for it and say, all right, after, you know, uh, 50,000 white men are fired and X amount of, uh, you know, black women or lesbian, bisexual, bipolar, bilingual, ambidextrous <laughs> um, janitors get promotions at the White House, uh, then, then we'll stop. The limiting factor, which they didn't do for COVID, not, they aren't doing for this. And also, like, ha have you noted, obviously you have, that, that it's like, we have just shifted like here, here's the spotlight. It went from COVID over BLM over to the diversity to the trans issue. Mm -hmm. I, I feel like I'm going crazy. Yeah, you're just they wondering just what's next. Right on. Yeah, what do you think is next? Oh my gosh, I've seen a lot of people talking about being trans ableist. Have you heard about that? No, please tell me. <laughs> so it's people who are able bodied that are taking on, you know, physical afflictions, like a woman who believes that she's blind, even though she can see a man who believes that he's an amputee, even though he has all of his limbs. Imagine that that is the future or maybe trans age, somebody who's 65 identifying as 15. This is these are the things I dream about, you know? Yeah, well, I think you're right. It might they might just all start combining. Right. And um one thing I've been experimenting with while doing stand-up comedy is I'll go on stage um, with an accent and then my accent will just keep changing. <laughs> so I kind of go in like this and I say, hello, I'm, you know, I'm not from here. And people, oh, they start applauding. I just got my green card. And then I'll, I'll just go into like an Indian accent or whatever this is. And I, I go, <laughs> I'm, I'm ethnic, ethnically fluid. And my... Wow. You know, my ethnicity changes. It just it changes all the time. That's who I am. I'm from <laughs> all over the globe, and at the same time, I'm not from anywhere. And they, the crowd, it's so sad because they don't know what to do. Yeah, I was going to ask I, you, is that well received? <laughs> it is well. It's well. It's neutrally received because people go to clap, but then they don't know. And but it's kind of silent. Mm. Until I sort of break character and I go, well, if I came up here and said I was a, a pregnant woman, you would all applaud. So I go, guys, strap in. This is next. Then they start to loosen up and then they start to laugh. But like I'm pushing it more every night to see what I can get away with. Right. I feel like with comedy now, there has to be this element of like letting the audience know that it's OK. I when I was watching comedy, you know, even when I was younger, in my early teens, there was never this element of like, we need to let you know that it's okay to laugh. Like, we need to give you that permission. Now it's like, uh, I go to a lot of comedy places out here in, in LA and they're What's that be like? What, what's the general vibe? I know it's probably a showcase, right? So you see five or six in a night. Right, exactly. I mean, the general vibe is that there is sort of this prescription of what you can and cannot say. And it might just be because, uh, you know, the lineup for the night happens to be particularly left leaning. But I feel like every woman that comes and is a comedian, it's all about either sex or feminism. Every black person, their entire set is about their skin color and juxtaposing it with white people. Every white man is sort of doing this 
self-deprecating white guilt type of humor. And there's never, it's very rarely do you see a comedian just go out there and say, you know what, I'm going to pull a Norm McDonald and like say things that are maybe crass or rude, but you're thinking it deep down and you know you want to say it. And here's the funny way to articulate that. You don't really get that anymore, which is kind of sad. I guess you haven't been to New York to see me perform at the Comedy Cellar, have you? <laughs> I have Is not. That... I have not taken a trip to New York. I will put that on the the list of things that I do need to do, though. <laughs> yeah, you you should you should. Co- I would love to have you there because I'm I am um, uh, once like you've been canceled or like the stuff that you know I know you've gone through and a lot of people that I'm sure are close uh, to you in your life now. You have a kind of I don't give a shit anymore vibe, and so I like I, I got turned down from so many comedy clubs over the years and then the covid vaccine so when i got into the comedy cellar i had my my following was growing i'm touring and so i i feel so lucky like i can't believe it all timed out where now the reason i got in there was from doing dylan mulvaney parodies right doing my days of girlhood and the owner saw it and i thought i just assumed he was this woke guy and i was way off he 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 was like, wait, you got canceled for this? You got fired for being white? He, you, this? He goes, I want you at the club even more now. Aww. So I go in and I just, man, I, I you know, I, I, I do a Eric Adams impression. I'll, I'll pretend to be like this homeless guy on the train begging for money <laughs> and who's lost his mind. And I'll go, yeah, that was when I met Eric Adams. You know, I'll, also, I'm sorry. I know a white guy can't do an impression of a mentally retarded person. So I'm sorry if that offended anybody. And mm. I just keep, and, and it's, people are, starving for it really okay so you don't get a lot of like hecklers or like that was disgusting i can't believe you said that i get one every week one or two but you know i'm doing four shows a night there so it's for about you know 500 to 800 people right so one or two every other night it's not so bad last night a woman came out and she just said I think you could have done that a little more tastefully. <laughs> and uh, then another crowd member walked out and he goes, go fuck yourself. <laughs> and she, and she kind of stumbled down the street. Right. Um, Cause comedy so is all people- about doing things tastefully. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, exactly. I was like, well, I think you should have, you could have heckled me a little more tastefully. Um, <laughs> yeah. I, th- I think people are, uh, I think the tide has turned and, um, it seems to be it seems to be going go going well, and I post the clips online and stuff, and nothing nothing terrible has happened yet. Um, That's amazing. I do have my flag half mass here for Bud Light, so beautiful. Uh, Bud Light. What and are Tucker they at Carlson. now? How how many lo- how much lost? Eight billion now? Something Is like that. Is it about eight billion? Yeah, it was a, it was a hefty. You know, it, the first time I saw it, it was like four billion dollars, five, six, seven. I think. Uh, They've they've really gone in the tanker with just one one little mistake. One I don't know if I'd call it a little mistake, but a one massive marketing failure. So what's your view on that? Because I know like we we don't we don't stand for cancel culture. So I, in these moments, I always try to take a step back and go, all right, am I doing the thing that I hate, or or is this um, is this an exception because it's trans ideology and kids are seeing it and kids are now seeing, wait a minute, you can have a man pretending to be a woman being celebrated on a major brand. Is that cross the line? Like what do you have a, like a line for yourself? Yeah. I mean, I think it's about sort of drawing the distinction between something like a boycott and cancel culture. I think a boycott can be an element of cancel culture, but I don't think that a lot of people are are coming out and saying, well, they shouldn't be a company anymore. They deserve to lose their livelihoods over this thing. I think at the end of the day, it's just about putting your money into companies and corporations or if you not even small businesses, if you can, that support your values rather than pushing forward uh, a narrative. Uh, it's it's far different, I think, than like deplatforming and and censoring somebody because they said something you don't like. Although I can see where people would make the the comparison because often boycotting and uh, you know telling people not to buy is a functional part of cancel culture in itself. But I, I think Bud Light is going to come through on this one. I think they're going to still be a company after this. I think they're just going to have learned a lesson. <laughs> Hopefully, yeah, you, made, you would think. You made a good distinction of, of you know, I hope they roll over and die versus 
hey, I'm not, I'm just not going to buy uh, the brand anymore. But I, I also right. argue if you're drinking a beer that tastes like piss, take a look <laughs> in the mirror maybe, and maybe that's the issue rather than Dylan Mulvaney <laughs> on one of their cans. <laughs> I've always said, you know, I was already not drinking Bud Light. Now I'm going to not drink it even harder. So uh, that's yeah. where I stand. <laughs> yeah. I, I, I tried it when I was 11 years old. I started drinking when I was 10. What? Which is why I'm so... Sh yeah. 10 years old. Yeah. 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 Oh my God. Who, uh, who well, allowed you know, this? When you're overwhelmed with such privilege as a white man living in Connecticut, you just... Uh, all you could do is turn to alcohol and, and crack cocaine and everything. So... Right. Typical. At 10 years old, I remember going... This is unacceptable to put in my body, you know. Let let's move over to Michelob Ultra or maybe a nice IPA or local Brooklyn Lager or something. Oh my gosh, what a distinguished young gentleman you were! <laughs> yes, yes. I wanted to also ask, like, I'm trying not to be mad at Dylan Mulvaney because as a content creator, that's getting sponsorships is not easy. I I have no sponsorships right now, and so part of me is like. Well, if somebody offered it to him, it's not it's not on him, right? Like, do, do you think right. it's good to not misdirect the the objective oh, here, yeah. the anger? I mean, regardless of what you're doing on social media, whether or not we deem it to be healthy, unhealthy, or whatever, a sponsorship comes knocking at your door, especially with some of the money that Bud Light was probably throwing at him for this. I mean, you can't really blame him for for taking this money, much like you can't blame him for taking the money from from Nike or uh, what other brands. Maybelline, I believe, is doing a sponsor. Uh, correct me if I'm wrong, but yeah, you you can't be blamed if. I think a lot of what these sponsorships are, you can come after the company and say, well, you made a horrible choice here. You didn't know your audience. But we should also recognize that what we see is a reflection of who we are. And there's a reason Dylan Mulvaney is getting sponsorships because people want to see Dylan Mulvaney. People want to hear from Dylan Mulvaney. And I think conservatives have inflamed that a little bit in, in their outrage. And, and that should be discussed as well. But it's just a reflection of the times. Right. What do you, do you think, um, what, what, what like marketing campaign do you think would put people over the edge in a way that is like far beyond Bud Light? Like, is there, I mean, I'm not sure you can go much further than a biological man doing a makeup campaign. So I, I almost, is it, isn't it almost sad that that didn't get more outrage than Bud Light? Because that's taking an actual job away from a female who would be doing um, a makeup campaign, right? Like she didn't take yeah. any jobs away from having her face or her, his face put on a can. Right. I mean, the, the interesting thing, I think maybe the distinction here is Bud Light is a brand that is predominantly bought and sold uh, to men and makeup is sold to women and where women will For put now. up with a lot of the bullshit... <laughs> Yeah, for now, right. <laughs> Women will put up with a lot of bullshit because of their their compassionate and nurturing and oh, we need to understand that this is just a different part of our society and that yeah, he too deserves our jobs and stuff like that. Men, who, especially probably men who are drinking Bud Light, are like, hell no, I'm not going to allow this to happen. Their assertiveness comes to the forefront, the aggressiveness comes to the forefront, and they're not willing to, uh, you know lose ground to this sort of ideology, whereas women are far softer. I mean, that might not be the root of why uh, it didn't get as much outrage, but I feel like it's a part of the pie. It, yeah, I think it is a part of pie. Yeah, so when the when the CEO or marketing VP or whoever, you know, that video was leaked where she's like, they're fatty. She also has like complete resting NPR face, I call it. I, I mean, you can, <laughs> can you just sense like a woke, super far left liberal now and i hate to say you it but can. you can see it in their face yeah you can oh yeah as soon as that video came I, i'm sure we had the same reaction of like oh yeah this makes total sense now all of this makes sense it's seeing something this video. like in their eyes i don't know what it is it's just kind of like you can just see that they're just they're, they're being led by some <laughs> woke higher power external force <laughs> 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 exclusivity yeah and uh, uh and inclusivity and 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 diversity and there's a lot of the more head nodding it's like a perpetual Gosh. head nodding we yeah just more yeah, yeah. the words just come out yeah it's like they're on like a rocking ship or something they're just always <laughs> more inclusivity and more 
it's yeah. all it's like we're just on this journey just floating through Gosh. the middle of nowhere and we just want to include everybody by excluding 99 percent of the country right right and our main consumer base as as is always the the first lesson in marketing okay so uh <laughs> are this this uh it is Dylan Mulvaney a man or a woman? I mean, to me, it's a simple answer. He's a biological man. So biological man. <laughs> now, yeah. now, I, th- this I I uh, had a debate with myself on my last episode that there's not there's no actual th- thing as trans because if you think you're a a, a a man who is actually a biological woman and that's how you think you were born. What are you transitioning to? God damn it. <laughs> All right, I'm moving a webcam. All right. Okay. It's like the universe saying, don't talk about this. It is. It, it's actually left to censorship. That's what's happening right now. Okay. So you were just saying trans people shouldn't be allowed in <clears throat> in schools and society. No. <laughs> <laughs> okay. So if, if, you're a, if you're a man who thinks they're a woman and that's who you were, since you were born, can you transition into a woman? What's the use of the word trans? Yeah, I guess if I'm gonna play, you know, devil's advocate here, it's just the transitional period of the bodily changes that you're going through, I would imagine. So they're saying, you know, I'm male bodied, right? But female mind. So I need to make my body match my mind. And that's the transitional part of that. And how about the argument that you no longer even need to change your biological state that you can just identify and, and oh that's all gosh. you need to do? It's just insane. And it's it's so insane that it's even causing a riff within the trans community, this whole self-identification thing, because even now they have a term called trans medicalist. So if you are a trans person and you have transitioned medically and you think that in order to actually identify as trans, you have to go through medical transition, you are now being called a trans medicalist, which is a uh, derogatory term, I guess, for believing that you should have to transition your body in order to claim the gender of choice it's just so crazy do we just sit back and, and let it all fall apart almost like it did with covid like d- d- like do we just sit back and go they're all gonna start fighting with themselves um and and that's that that's gonna solve the problem almost like saying okay now merrick eric adams is the uh, the mayor you said we needed a a black mayor well uh it's not going so well so maybe we need to go back to uh, uh, electing people based on their qualifications. Right. I think there's an element of sitting and watching and allowing people to feel the burden of their own ideology and their own thinking. But there also is just like lines that need to be drawn in the sand where I refuse to just like sit and watch is children being involved in in this debate and being made to feel gender confused and asked to transition. I'm like, you know, that's my line in the sand, protecting children. If you're an adult and you want to go down this path and do whatever you want and post day 365 of being a girl by all means i'm going to criticize you you can but by all means go ahead and do it uh children is where absolutely not i cannot stand by and and just watch right and when you take away the nuance from the conversation you can no longer have these debates i mean i've lost so many friends who just said we're done you misgendered somebody um you said trans is a mental illness which I don't think it's a negative thing. It's just, hey, it needs to be dealt with in a serious way uh, right. with a medical professional. Um, I mean, I just lost somebody I've had a 35-year relationship with, one of the closest people in my life, because of this. Like, we're, we're, we're done. And it's, wow. uh, it's so tragic. I know, like, mind virus is probably a way to, way to describe it. Um, yeah, it's like a parasite. It's do like you think a parasite. A, do you think uh, do you think a national divorce is the only way to go? I was completely against it, but I'm not sure there's any way forward. How, how do we this this is like witchcraft times. I don't know how how we yeah, get past I mean, it. I'm I'm not personally in the line of thinking that a national divorce is the only way to to go through this. I think a lot are of people again still together? need to What was that? Are are your parents alive? Are they still together or are you my parents are both alive, but not together anymore. 
Oh, so okay. they've they've divorced. Oh. <laughs> that was the only way through it for them. <laughs> All right. So you um, you you went the route of things will be okay. I'm like nobody will last. Let's break right. it up. And it's my fault. I think it's, it's going to be fault. okay at the end of the day. At the end of the day, we're humans. Uh, we go through squabbles like this all the time. I will say this is a particularly intense one, but I think, you know, so many people are just rational and reasonable. They're just not speaking and they're not a part of this debate. And when you're in the center of it, like we both are, it feels like it's all encompassing and that it's encroached on everything. But I'm, I'm not sure that that's actually the case. We're also getting all, all of the silent people reaching out to us. So, like, I think we have a more clear view of how many more people are against it because we're getting those silent people, I'm sure, DMing you and, and, and right. pulling you aside. And every once in a while, I'll have a celebrity follow me. I'll go, what? Like a childhood celebrity. I'm like, yeah, th that's that's mind blowing. And th that's their way of just saying, hey, keep 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 it up. Yeah, you're hearing from like actors, comedians, I don't know, janitors, police officers, teachers, and they're all just whispering like, hey, I watch your content. And even it's interesting because I'll get DMs from celebrities who will not follow my account, but will DM me to be like, hey, I really love your stuff because they don't Screenshot. want the public Screenshot. record. Screenshot. <laughs> Expose them. That's come on. <laughs> You know, it's like I, I I get it in some sense of like it's kind of like the whole debate with the swimmers and Leah Thomas, you know, the, everybody's saying, why don't these women stand up and, and speak for themselves? And I felt that way, of course. But it's like when you've dedicated your whole life to something, they're sort of doing this risk versus benefit and and saying, you know what, I'd rather keep my career than be open about it. And I. I understand it. I begrudgingly understand it. And I wish they would, you know, come forward and speak out like you have, like I have, like other people have. Uh, but I, just being realistic, I know they're not going to. Don't you think there's a time when we have to just stop even <sighs> interacting? Do you know what I mean? Like we need, we need all hands on deck at this point. And so. Yeah. It's just I, hard. I, I don't know. I, it's hard to. I, I I guess I just put to rest and put to bed that there are some people that you're never going to convince to to take that step and take that leap forward. And uh, maybe they don't hold their conviction strongly enough to do it. But I find that hard to believe. I feel like they are just sitting in agony, like biting their tongue all the time. And I wish they would. But I don't know. Well, I just don't I know that it's realistic. I think what you're doing is is a great approach because you're well, A, your career is exploding. You're uh, you seem happy. Like it's, it's kind of that, that method of, of just living your life and letting people come join if they want. I mean, the amount of people that have reached out to me that have disowned me or said, you need to stop doing this, who now just by looking at my, the numbers I'm pulling in, they feel like, oh, okay. It, he wasn't killed for this. It's going well. His dreams are coming true. So let me kind of circle back and give them a call or something. So I try right. to not be resentful when that happens and just, you know, say, hey, thanks for reaching out or whatever. But that's a good sign, I think. Does that happen to you? People that have fallen out of your life come back? You know, not really. That is not, <laughs> that is not happened yet. I don't know. Uh, yeah, me Maybe neither. the message... Maybe the message is a little too extreme for them. We shall see. I mean, I certainly had with like family and personal life and uh, going through this transition, people being like, oh my gosh, I cannot believe you're a conservative. And now that, you know, they're family and they realize I haven't changed all that much. It's a lot softer and everything's fine now. But as far as people outside of just the core individuals in my life, I haven't really had a lot of like to turn around, circle back. You know what? Now that I've considered things, uh, you might be right about it. Maybe they're doing it silently, though. Who knows? A silent circle back. Yeah. <laughs> I the hardest have, part is admitting it. <laughs> I'll have people, they kind of look at me like I'm an alien because they, they were people that, you know, I'm back in the comedy club, so I have to see people all the time that I know, you know, hated me and, and publicly hated me and, and all that stuff. Um so it's kind of interesting they see me because they're they have this view of who I am of this like far right crazy you know capital stormer and like I'm no different I just didn't want to get the vaccine and 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 I'm not okay with kids cutting their genitals off but nothing else has changed my comedy's the same so it's kind of fun to see them walk walk in and kind of like they kind of I don't know if you ever watch Curb Your Enthusiasm but Larry David kind of like does this yeah. 
huh, okay. They kind of yeah. like check me out and they're, they're looking for something that's not there. I have fun with it now because, um, because life is going well. So, <laughs> Yeah, that's the greatest part of just like defying people's expectations of just being like this horrible, racist, I don't know, derogatory individual. And then they meet you again or they, they see you again and they're just like, oh, oh, you can say all this stuff online and it doesn't completely turn you into an evil demon person <laughs> and it's just normal. And I think they might not think that through all in that moment of, of seeing you again, but it will stick with them. And later down the line, it should it should pop up again and they'll realize it's OK to question the narrative. It's really okay. Yeah, and when you also kind of, I always say, well, how are you doing? What, has your life improved? Are you, are you, have you built your following? Are you touring? Are you doing, and usually the answer is no. So hmm. they kind of come back and what I get often now is like, hey, how, can you help me with my YouTube page? Like I'll have people that have hated me, they'll just walk right up and go, can you help me figure out my YouTube page? I'm like, are you, Hilarious. Are you kidding me? Yeah, right. After all is said and done, when they see the success of speaking for your values, they yeah. they want a piece of it. They want like, the help. Go, go on the YouTube page and watch what I'm doing. And if you want to do that, um, one one final question I had about sure. Dylan Mulvaney because I think I had one pitch for Starbucks for doing um, like a Dylan Mulvaney sponsored drink. Um, yeah, it may be like the Dylan, uh, you know the Grande Mulvaney where it's a decaf um, coffee drink and then halfway through <laughs> it changes its mind and becomes caffeinated and then you're up all night and it ruins your life and rips apart your family and um, <laughs> you lose your job. And, and uh, so that's, I'm going to pitch that to Starbucks. Wow. You know what? That would be knowing the audience, right? Okay, Bud Light, maybe not so much. Starbucks, I actually think that that's perfect. They might have, you know, a few tweaks they want to have on the actual actual drink. I'm not sure about the legalities of tricking people into drinking caffeinated drinks, but I think that is the company to go for. That's the corporation. It has, it's called caffeine dysphoria. It's it doesn't it just keeps changing. <laughs> it's fluid. It's the I drink feel is like even as a meme, people would buy that. I think it's a hit, Tyler. Right. I think you so need to I'll, get in the right room. I will make that video and send it to you. <laughs> but uh, Ma, thank you so much for coming on the show and uh, for putting up with our, our internet errors and everything. And um, huh. where can where can people check you out? Anywhere on any social media, you can type in my mouthful of a name that's Amla Epinobi, or you can check out Unapologetic right above my head there. And uh, you'll find me on YouTube and all podcast platforms. Yeah, I look forward to And you to can see her with her arm around me while I'm crying on Dr. Phil in front of <laughs> Candace Owens. And... and it will never happen again for Dr. Phil is over. I wonder what's the next show that we run into each other on. Yeah, well, let's make it happen. And let me know if you're ever we in will. New York. I will. I will. I'll go see one of your shows. Keep up the great work. Back at ya. Ciao. Hey, thanks for watching the episode, everybody. Much appreciated. If you'd like to support this show, head on over to Locals, tylerfisher.locals.com. And uh, look, that's where I fund all my stuff. So if you like my stuff, share me some money. And it'll go to the podcast. It'll go to the videos. It'll go to everything you see. If you like me, that's a great way to support it because you never know when I can get canceled. Subscribe to the channel. Please leave a comment. Tell me who else you want to see on the show. Tell me whatever you want. Like, subscribe. I love you. Do something nice for yourselves. And I'll see you next week.